It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Emily Cunningham. Uh, I met Emily when she was an undergrad at Haverford for English Beth Wilman. Uh, and then from there, she went on to complete her PhD at UC Santa Cruz and was then a uh, Flatiron Research Fellow at the Center for Computational Astrophysics in New York, and is now a Hubble Fellow over at Columbia. Um, and Emily is leading a wide range of studies on, on the stellar halo of the Milky Way um, in order to understand all the things to understand galaxy evolution. Um, and she's leading these studies using both observations and theory. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Gertina, for the introduction and for hosting me. And thank you to everyone who I've gotten to chat with today and for everyone I'll be chatting with tomorrow. It's been so much fun to do an in-person visit because it's been, you know, so difficult to do them these last few years. So it's so great to be here. Thank you so much for having me and thanks for coming. Um, so I am interested in the Milky Way. And so I wanted to start, start my talk with a little anecdote. Uh, so a few years back when I was still a graduate student at UC Santa Cruz, I was at this barbecue and I was chatting with this guy. It was his house. It was a very fancy house and he's in venture capital. And so he had a physics PhD, <laughs> now he's in venture capital. And he's one of those guys who's pretty sure he's got everything in academia figured out, right? So he asked me what I worked on. Oh, I studied the Milky Way. He was like, oh, like that hasn't been studied enough, right? And I was like, excuse me. <laughs> um, but what I told him while smiling with my teeth and not my eyes <laughs> was that actually the Milky Way is really difficult to study because we are inside of it. So here I'm showing you the very beautiful image of the Milky Way from the Gaia satellite where we can see the beautiful disk of our galaxy. We have beautiful dust lanes and we have the center of the galaxy here hosting a supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way. But as you can see, this doesn't look like what you would picture if I mentioned the word galaxy, right? So we have this very difficult position of trying to understand our own galactic home from within this galaxy. But not only is it hard, well, then this guy, you know, he says, oh, but I bet there have been a million papers on that, right? And I had to say, well, actually, it's really important that we observe the Milky Way because the Milky Way is the only galaxy in the universe that we can study on an individual star by star basis from the inside. And so as a result, because we have the highest resolution picture possible within our own galaxy, it provides these critical tests of galaxy formation and our cosmological models. So even though it's really hard, it's really important to study the Milky Way. And then the guy was like, oh, I never thought about that before. And it's like shocking. Right? <laughs> Okay, and so in the Milky Way, my particular interest is in the stellar halo. And so you can't really see the stellar halo very well in this image, so I want to show you a picture of a simulation. So this is an image from the Latte suite of simulations of the fire two, the fire two simulations. And this is a Milky Way analog, though its name is Latte. And here we can see a beautiful spiral galaxy, just like we think our own Milky Way is. And it's embedded in this huge structure that is very diffuse, but is also highly structured. You see these extended streams and features surrounding the disk of the Milky Way. And this is the component that's known as the stellar halo. And so how do we think the Milky Way got its dark matter halo? Uh, the answer is through the accretion, primarily through the accretion of dwarf galaxies. So I can show you a movie of the simulation highlighting what this looks like, where we think the Milky Way halo is embedded, the Milky Way is embedded in a huge halo of dark matter and strewn throughout this dark matter halo are stars. And we think they got there through the accretion of dwarf galaxies. So this is a classic simulation, the Bullock and Johnston suite. This is an end body simulation of dwarfs being thrown onto a Milky Way like parent potential. And we can see these dwarfs disrupt, are tidally disrupted by the Milky Way's gravitational potential. And they form these very beautiful extended streams and structures. And so one thing that's special about the stellar halo is that you can see this is a snapshot of redshift zero. And we saw this in Latte too. It's highly structured, right? We can see these over densities. And that's a result of the fact that the dynamical times out in the halo are so long compared to the age of the galaxy and the age of the universe that these structures can be very long lived. And so we can use their positions and their velocities as a link to their initial conditions and try to re retrace the dwarfs that contributed to the overall Milky Way uh, halo, uh, yeah, overall Milky Way halo. 
So we can use their motions and positions, but we can also use their chemical abundances because the chemical abundances will have imprinted the environment in which these stars formed, which is very different than our Milky Way disk galaxy because these are dwarf galaxies. So that's a major goal of a lot of studies of the Milky Way halo is to use the kinematic and chemical properties of halo stars to understand the evolution of our galaxy, to understand the buildup of our own galaxy's dark matter halo, and to study the systems that contributed to that halo. And so I just want to show, I've shown a lot of simulations, but I want to just emphasize that this is not a purely theoretical concept. We see this plenty of this in the data. So here I'm showing you, this is called the field of streams images from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, where here I'm just showing you maps of the sky where the color is indicating distance. And so you see these streams of stars at common distances that have been labeled. So this is the Sagittarius stream. It's the most massive stream in our galaxy. It's debris is all over the place. I'll talk more about Sag later. We see the colder GD1 stream. We see the Orphan stream. And so we see this hierarchical galaxy formation in action in our stellar halo, in both observations and our simulations. Okay, so why, why is this cool? I've touched on this a little bit, uh, but I want to emphasize why, why anyone here might be interested in stellar halos. Uh, in particular, stellar halos contain some of the oldest, most metal poor stars in the galaxy. So if you're interested in first stars, you might be interested in stellar halo. Uh, in addition, it's composed of the remnants of dwarf galaxies, so we can use halo stars within our own galaxy to study the remains of systems that formed at high redshift and have not survived till present day. And we can study those systems on a star by star basis within our own galaxy, even if they're too faint to observe in the field at high redshift. In addition, we can use halo stars to trace the dark matter distribution of our galaxy. We would really like to know and highly constrain the mass of the Milky Way, for example. And so we can use halo stars to trace the dark matter distribution and study the mass distribution in our galaxy. Uh, and furthermore, as you can see, uh, because the stellar halo is tracing the, the mass assembly history, it's tracing because the stars are tracing the dark matter that fell in, in addition to the overall dark matter distribution, we can use stellar halos to constrain the mass assembly history of the Milky Way and ask how, what kinds of dwarfs at what times contributed to the overall buildup of the galaxy. And sort of these, these uh, parameters, you know, the mass assembly history uh, and the overall mass and the accretion history are fundamental to placing the Milky Way in its cosmological context. Okay, so it's a really exciting time to work on this topic because people say we're in a galactic renaissance. There are like actual conferences called like the galactic renaissance. And so I want to touch on sort of what's going on here and why this is. So as I mentioned, right, what we want is 60 phase space. We want motions, we want positions and chemical abundances of stars in the Milky Way halo. We'd like to measure these out to the burial radius of the Milky Way to trace the dark matter distribution and to learn about the mass assembly history of the galaxy. And the good news is that we're getting we're getting these data. They're coming all the time. So in particular, in order to do this, we need photometry to, in order to find the stars in the first place. And so we have amazing photometry from pan stars. I showed you the beautiful image from Gaia. We're going to have amazing photometry of the Milky Way in order to try, uh, trace the density distribution from Rubin Observatory's LSST. Uh, in addition, we need astrometry to do this. We need to measure the tangential motions of stars in order to have 3D motions. Uh, and so we have this right now in the Gaia, from Gaia. We are in the Gaia era, and it's very exciting, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but upcoming, of course, Rubin LSST, and eventually Roman Space Telescope, which is very exciting. Um, and then we need spectroscopy for that final component of motion, the radial velocity and the chemical abundance information. So Gaia has its own spectra, of course, and then there are all of these very exciting uh, spectroscopic surveys that are planned as complements to the Gaia mission. Uh, or, you know, DESI is so exciting uh, based here. And um, also I want to mention SDSS-5, which I'm a part of. So this is really exciting. We are we have more data than we ever have in our own Milky Way, and we're getting more all of the time. So it's a great time to be working on this topic. And I just want to highlight a couple of fun results that we've learned just in the Gaia era, uh, which really began when I started grad school was when Gaia launched. 
Uh, so this is all really recent developments. Um, I should start like that makes it sound like I'm so young, but I'm not. Like it's just it was a few. It was I guess in the last uh, what year is it? Nine years. Okay, it's been a while. Um, I forgot how long ago it was that I started grad school. Okay, so. <laughs> Um, these, this here is the, again, the Gaia image of the Milky Way with some new stream discoveries over plotted. This is from the S5 collaboration, um, showing a bunch of new streams and new extensions of streams that have been discovered in the Gaia era, which is really exciting. Um, in addition, there's this emerging consensus in the Milky Way community that the inner halo is dominated predominantly by debris from a single massive accretion event. It is unfortunately called the Gaia sausage sometimes. It is called Gaia Enceladus sometimes. Most of the times I just refer to it as Gaia sausage Enceladus just to be agnostic about the different discoveries, um, but it's it's unpleasant <laughs> to have to do that. Um, but it is what it is. Uh, but essentially this you know, really wasn't known before the Gaia era that our inner halo would be dominated by debris from a single massive accretion event. And so Gaia self sausage Enceladus is contributing most of the stars in the inner halo. Um, that, that this is the the emerging consensus. So they're always they're always arguments. We can talk about that after if you want. Um, but in addition to Gaia sausage Enceladus, uh, Gaia has revealed a halo that is rife with substructures. There have been so many exciting structures that have been discovered in the Milky Way, uh, in phase space, and in chemical space. So I'm highlighting a few. You know colder stellar streams, these are maybe more globular cluster level streams, as well as debris from dwarf galaxies that are being identified in the data, which is really exciting. But one thing that remains a challenge is interpreting these observations, is going from here is a substructure in phase space and maybe in chemical space as well. How do I go from this observation to an inference about this is the dwarf galaxy that brought in these stars, this was its mass, this is when I think it fell in. How do we go from the data to mapping back the Milky Way's assembly history? And so a critical tool in this analysis is, of course, the simulations. So we've had incredible data coming out in the Milky Way, but we've also had great advancement in the last 10 years in hydrodynamical simulations of Milky Way mass galaxies. So this is a fun movie from the fire suite. So I'm, I'm gonna talk more about the fire simulations because those are the simulations that, the cosmological simulations that I've worked with primarily. Um, but in fire, we have live disks and halos, uh, live disks, live halos. We have dwarf dwarf interactions. We have dwarfs interacting with disks. We have all of these complicated, we have all these complex uh, self-consistent you know, galaxy formation mechanisms in play at once, which is, you know, in some ways difficult because it's difficult to identify a concrete, uh, a concrete question sometimes because there's so much going on. But the reality is when there's a lot going on in the simulations, there's often a lot going on in the real Milky Way too. And so that's why cosmological simulations for me are a great tool for testing and building new analysis methods to develop ways of interpreting observations that we find in the Milky Way. So this is not reality, but it's a realistic setting to test analysis procedures for making inferences about the Milky Way from data. Okay, so that leads me to what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, so my talk has two parts. I'm going to start by talking about using halo stars to trace the dark matter distribution in and disequilibrium in the Milky Way. I want to give a big shout out to Gertina, who's one of my collaborators on this topic, as well as, of course, Nico Garavito Camargo, who I started collaborating with when he was still a grad student here and I now collaborate with at Flatiron. Um, I also want to mention Alex Riley, who was a student uh, at Texas A&M, who collaborated with me uh, on this project. He's now a postdoc uh, at Durham University. And then in part two, I want to talk about the dwarf galaxy progenitors of the Milky Way stellar halo and how we can use halo chemical abundances of halo stars to make inferences about the populations of dwarf galaxies that contributed to the buildup of the Milky Way stellar halo. And here I also want to make sure I acknowledge the students who contributed to this work. So I'll talk about him more later, but Nand Panita and Paisal is an awesome grad student at UPenn. He is on the job market. Look out for him. He's incredible. Um, and then I also want to acknowledge Danny Horta, who was a grad student when we started collaborating, but is now a Flatiron Research Fellow at CCA. Okay, take a quick water break. I haven't given a lot of in-person talks <laughs> recently. <laughs> 
So a quick question. Yeah. What is the relative mass of the stellar halo and the stellar disk of the Milky Way? Yeah, so in general, it's about one hundredth of the mass is the expectation. Now that depends on if you're counting the Large Magellanic Cloud in your stellar halo uh, estimate, but overall, yeah, about one one hundredth. Yeah, that's right, right. Yeah, like, Did I ask it slightly different. How about yeah. stellar luminosity? Stellar luminosity. I think it's the same. I think it's maybe no, that can't be right. It's called the young stars in the disk. I think it's 99%. I, in my head, I say 99% of the light of the galaxy is in the disk relative to the 1% in the halo, but there's probably a more granular answer to that. Um, but that's the back of my hand. So, yeah. Cool. Any other questions while we're, while we're paused? For folks online, if you just raise your hand on the, um, I'll be paying attention. So I'll call on you if you have a question. Okay, cool. So part one, dark matter distribution and disequilibrium in the Milky Way. So I introduced you know, this talk with this stunning image of the Milky Way galaxy from the Gaia satellite, and I neglected the big uh, elephant in the room in this, in this image, which are these guys down here, the large and small Magellanic clouds. Now I wanna preface the next, uh, the next part of my talk by saying, I mean, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the LMC. And some of this is very surprising to people when I talk in other departments. You all already, I know, are going to be like, Gertina has been telling us this for years. Like, so, so sorry for everyone for whom this is extensive review, but I'm going to go through it anyway for myself. Um, so the Large Magellanic Cloud is the Milky Way's largest satellite, most massive satellite. Uh, and the LMC, you know, it's, you know, you can observe it naked eye from the, from the Southern Hemisphere. I have never seen it. Can you raise your hand if you've seen it? Ah, so much jealousy. It's a bucket list. You haven't seen it, Christina? Oh, That's right. You <laughs> know. Um, so it is very beautiful. Uh, but the Mil yeah, so it's the most massive satellite in the Milky Way. It's about 50 kiloparsecs from the galactic center. And the classic picture of the LMC was that it was happily orbiting the Milky Way on a relatively circular orbit on a period of about two giga years. And then its mass was about one one hundredth of the overall Milky Way, about 10 to the 10 solar masses. Uh, so this was, you know, a lot, a lot of work on this topic, uh, supporting this classical picture. But there was fundamental uncertainty on the tangential motion of this satellite. We, we only could measure radial velocities towards and away from us. For a long time, we were very limited and unable to measure the tangential motion, the other two components of motion in the plane of the sky. So this picture really changed. One of the big contributions to this picture changing was the measurement of the LMC's proper motion led by Nitya Calabiolo. And what Nitya's papers found was that the velocity of the Large Magellanic Cloud was close to the escape velocity of the Milky Way. And so at this velocity, it was completely inconsistent with the picture that the LMC was happily, happily orbiting the Milky Way on a two year orbit. And this led to the changing paradigm that we now have that the LMC is likely on first infall into the Milky Way. And of course, Gertine has been a huge part of that conversation, really leading this conversation on our shifting paradigm of the LMC fall, being on first and fall. Um, furthermore, not only is the LMC on first and fall, the LMC is also, there's mounting evidence that it's much more massive than we previously thought. And so I've highlighted that there are numerous Numerous uh, works on this topic, some of which have been led by Gertina and her group, um, using you know, analysis of rotation curves of the Large Magellanic Cloud, using abundance matching, analysis of the satellite populations of the LMC based on the timing argument, uh, models of the Magellanic system, and perturbations to tidal streams that are nearby the Magellanic Clouds. There's a ton of evidence that the LMC is likely not 1 100th the mass of the Milky Way, but on the order of 1 to 10, or maybe even 20% of the total mass of the Milky Way. And so this is, this is now serious. Now it's been known for a while that this was serious. This is a paper from Abner and King in 1967, where they make the point, contrary to a widely published the gravitational effect of the Magellanic clouds on the Milky Way is indeed serious. And this was in the one to 10 picture, right? So now we're in, um, sorry, the one to 100 pictures. Now we're in a one to 10 or maybe one to five picture. This is even more serious. So we cannot 
neglect the large Magellanic cloud when we're thinking about the potential in the dark matter distribution in the Milky Way. And so someone who has also been uh, so important to this work and really a leader in this field is that is Nico Garavito Camargo. So I want to highlight this beautiful figure from Nico's paper where Nico ran n-body simulations of a smooth Milky Way being perturbed by the large Magellanic cloud at different masses. And what Nico found is not only is it just a perturbation to the overall potential of the Milky Way, it's also predicted to do, induce a wake in the dark matter halo. <laughs> and so to show that here in this, in this beautiful figure, it also really looks like a brain. Yeah. It's like a brain, but it's also the Milky Way dark matter wake. Um, the disk of the Milky Way is right here. I don't know if you can see, it's kind of hard to see where, from where I'm standing, but the, the red point here is the position of the large Magellanic cloud. And the large Magellanic cloud's orbit is indicated by this red line. And what we see is that the, um, there's this overdensity trailing the LMC in its orbit. And this is, um, this is sort of the classical Chandrasekhar dynamical friction wake, where what's going on here is that we have the dark matter particles that are feeling the, influ the gravitational influence locally from the LMC, and they are attracted to the LMC and they start trailing, it builds up this overdensity, uh, trailing the LMC in its orbit, and this in turn exerts an effective drag force on the satellite. Um, this is dynamical friction. We also see this global feature here, this mode, like the overall modal response of the halo. So we have the overdensity opposite to the LMC, and we have the overdensity trailing the LMC. So in addition to this wake, included in this wake is this uh, effect called the reflex motion, where not only is the LMC changing the density structure of the Milky Way stellar halo, it's moving the center of the Milky Way. So this is, again, a really handy movie from Nico where the LMC is this white dot and the center of the Milky Way is shown by the orange contours. And you can see that the LMC comes in, it moves the Milky Way with respect to the center of its dark matter halo. And so the inner Milky Way halo is off center from the outer Milky Way halo as a result of this interaction, um, as a result of the interaction due to the LMC. And so this is huge for changing the velocity. Or this is really important for interpreting observations of velocities of stars in the halo, because for a long time, we've treated it as though we are at the center of the Milky Way are in the center of that halo. And from these simulations, it's really looking like that shouldn't be the case at all. And we need to take into account this, re, we call it the reflex motion associated that's induced by the LMC's inflow. Okay, so I've shown you from Nico's work that there's this prediction that the LMC is inducing this large scale perturbation to the Milky Way's halo. But I also started this talk by introducing the fact that the stellar halo is very structured. The stellar halo is composed of the remains of accreted dwarfs, so it's highly structured, and there are these small scales uh, perturbations or small scale disequilibrium due to substructure. So when I was in the last year of my PhD, I was going around giving talks, and I was showing this plot here on the right, uh, showing substructure in one of the fire simulations, where here I've taken a map of fire simulations and I've divided it up into little cells and I've computed this quantity known as velocity anisotropy. And I found that this quantity was varying depending on where I looked on the sky. And you can kind of tell from this map that a lot of that has to do with over densities, that these fluctuations are corresponding to over densities due to disrupting satellites. Um, at the same time that I was giving my talks at the end of my PhD showing these maps. Nico is giving talks showing this map, uh, which is also a velocity anisotropy from his simulations, where um, this map here is color coded. Uh, so this is a map in a shell of a simulation color coded by the velocity anisotropy at a given pointing in the sky. And you can see that there are these large scale fluctuations in the kinematic properties compared to the smaller scale fluctuations that I was seeing in the fire simulations. And this was also in response to um, some observational work that I did where I found that when I measured velocity and isotropy in different parts of the sky, I got different answers. So the this sort of begged the question, how can we disentangle disequilibrium on large scales due to something like the influence of the large Magellanic cloud versus on small scales due to something like galactic substructure. 
So this inspired us to work on this paper together where we wanted to wonder if maybe spherical harmonics could be a tool for disentangling the disequilibrium on different spatial scales. Now, if you need a review of spherical harmonics, you are not the only one. I needed one when I started this project for sure. Uh, so here I'm showing you the spherical harmonics um, from L equals zero down to L equals four. So L is the order of the spherical harmonic. And so L equals zero is the monopole. And then as we increase in L, we are able to resolve features on smaller and smaller spatial scales, right? So L equals one is the dipole. And then as we go down, we can see L equals two has two bright spots, whereas L equals four has you know three bright spots. And if we change in M values, this changes the orientation and the phase of our different structures. So spherical harmonics are super useful because they're an orthogonal basis that can describe any function on the surface of the sphere. And so what we wanted to do was see if this could be a way that we could disentangle the contribution from the LMC versus smaller scale features. Okay. So to show you how this works, I want to first show you these maps where these are Nico simulations of the LMC falling into the smooth Milky Way. And so what you're looking at here are velocity maps in the three components of motion. So this is a spherical shell in NICO simulation at 25 kiloparsecs, and this is a map of radial velocity as a function of position on the sky. And so I've indicated the position of the LMC in these maps by this star. And so it's color coded by radial velocity, so you can see the, the signatures of the wake almost immediately if you look. So you see that it's yellow right here trailing the LMC in its orbit, right? And it's blue here. So this is uh, these this blue region are particles that are moving in towards the towards the center of the Milky Way and these um, along the orbital path of the LMC and these yellow points are coming out following the LMC in its orbit. So these are stars that are trapped in that classical dynamical friction wake. Um, here I have polar velocity and here I have uh, azimuthal velocity or rotational velocity and I want to highlight in these B phi and B theta maps that you can see these converging motions where these stars are moving towards, stars on either side are moving towards the orbit, the orbital path of the LMC. And so then below, I'm showing you a low order expansion of in spherical harmonics of these maps, where you can see that these features, the salient features describing the wake are captured by this relatively low order expansion. So you have, um, so first of all, yeah, it's just doing a good job of reproducing the maps that we expect for, for this perturbation. Um, in addition, one, uh, one of the features that, it, uh, that we can quantify is this radial velocity dipole. And so we can use the angular power spectrum, which are the coefficients that go in front of each of the spherical harmonics, in order to quanti put, a, put an actual number on these, on the contribution to different, to different orders. Um, so here I'm showing you, this is the total power on the y-axis, and this is the spherical harmonic order L on the x-axis. And what Nico saw in his simulations that he had established in his 2019 paper on this was that there is a visually a radial velocity dipole that increases as you move farther out in distance from the center of the Milky Way. And this is due in large part to that reflex motion where the inner halo is offset from the center of the dark matter halo. So as you move farther out in distance, you're you know, closer to, uh, how should I say this? As you move farther out in distances, you're using more of the outer halo stars that are offset with respect to that inner halo. And we can put a number on this by computing the angular power spectrum where here purple is 45 kiloparsecs, orange is 70 kiloparsecs, and uh, blue is 100 kiloparsecs. And we can you know, write down how this is changing as a function of distance using spherical harmonics. Um, and so we did this uh, again in ECO's 2021 paper where we computed the total, the total power in the dipole mode um, for his simulations as a function of distance um, and how this is related to the center of mass being offset from the center of the dark matter halo, of the outer dark matter halo. 
Okay, and so using our angular power spectrum, we can also compare LMCs with different masses. And so in Nico's suite, he had four different uh, LMC masses that he simulated. And so I'm showing you here the power spectrum for the three components of motion in for different masses. And you can see that the shape overall is very of the power spectrum is very consistent for the four models, but the amplitude scales really, really nicely with mass. And so, so that was reassuring to see. That was reassuring to see. But I motivated this talk with the fact, or this you know, section of the talk, with the fact that we have to worry about substructure. So in order to test whether or not this method would work, if we had uh, a halo that was uh, formed of different um, accreted dwarfs, as we expect, we think we're pretty sure the Milky Way's halo is formed uh, primarily through the accretion of dwarf galaxies. So in order to test this, we looked at some simulations uh, that are just accreted dwarf galaxies, stellar halos from purely accreted dwarf galaxies. So we turned to Bullock and Johnston. So I want to mention it was uh, particularly useful to use Bullock and Johnston for this uh, exercise because they don't have live dark matter halos. So we're looking at the power spectrum completely in the absence of any dark matter halo response to the infalling dwarfs. We're just looking at the effects of substructure. So, um, so for Bullock and Johnston, we looked at a map, a uh, radial velocity map, composed purely of high luminosity satellites. So these are like the extreme accretion histories. They have the accretion histories that are cosmological and more expected, but you can combine dwarfs however you want. Um, so we have the extreme high luminosity satellite stellar halo shown here. And I want to emphasize that in my first figures, the amplitude on the color bar was maybe plus or minus 40 kilometers per second. And here we're looking at plus or minus 200 kilometers per second. So we can see that these massive dwarfs do leave, you know, large scale features. There are large scale dramatic features in this map as a result of the substructure. However, in contrast, if we look at a halo made purely of low luminosity satellites, it's much smoother, right? We can see that it's much less dramatic, the disequilibrium on the large scales. We can also look at a halo that was that's entirely comprised of recent accretion events, and you can see here it's again very dramatic, lots of lots of lots of structure, lots of features. Um, in contrast to a halo that's comprised purely from events that were created very early on, where they've been mixing in the halo for a really long time and can't necessarily be resolved as clear kinematic substructure. So we could quantify this with the angular power spectrum, where this is again the radial velocity power spectrum shown from halos with the different accretion events. And the LMC simulation suite is shown by the shaded purple region. And so in terms of the large spatial scales, uh, which again is low L values, we can look at you know, L equals one, two, et cetera. The LMC is still, you know, expected to produce a stronger signal in these older modes, except for the halo that is made up purely of recent accretion events and the halo that's made up of primarily massive high luminosity accretion events. So this is good news for us because we think Milky Way has had a relatively quiescent recent massive accretion history with two huge exceptions, one of which is the Large Magellanic Cloud. And the other is the Sagittarius stream. So I showed you the Sagittarius stream as seen in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey um, earlier on in the talk, but I want to show you this beautiful image of um, this is the Milky Way and our ray from PanStars. And this debris that you see all over the place is from the Sagittarius stream. And so Sagittarius might be one of these features that we need to worry about if we want to you know, detect the, the magnitude of that velocity dipole, if we want to detect these large scale perturbations, um, large scale perturbations to the velocity field, we might need to worry about Sagittarius. So in order to test this, what we did was we took uh, two models for Sagittarius, so I'll just show the results here from one, um, and we injected them onto the LMC simulations. Nico's LMC simulations. Now, I want to mention that the, there's a big caveat here where we weren't modeling SAG and the LMC self-consistently at the same time. We weren't really using the dark matter. We, we didn't have a dark matter model for um, SAG that was interacting with Nico simulations or anything like that. We literally just painted a Sagittarius model onto our Wretch of Zero stellar halo. And so again, I'm showing you radial velocity, polar velocity maps. 
and azimuthal velocity maps. Um, and you can kind of see on top what Sagittarius looks like in these distance slices. And this here is a model of Sagittarius from Dennis Urkel. And so we computed the power spectrum in these cases and found that at low L values, Sagittarius does contribute to the overall power spectrum. So including Sagittarius is the solid line here, excluding Sagittarius LMC only is the dotted line here. And for the dot dash line, I'm showing you the difference between the two power spectra. And you'll notice the orange and blue lines. These are for the larger distance bins. Um, so at 70 and 100 kiloparsecs. And there, it, the signal was totally dominated by the LMC only simulation. Sagittarius was not contributing hardly at all. So I didn't even bother to show the power spectrum uh, from Sag alone. So at lower distances, this is, you know, the 45 kiloparsecs range, we found that yes, Sagittarius can contribute, but not overwhelm the signal due to the LMC. So that was re really reassuring. So sort of my takeaway from this was that we should model Sagittarius. We need to worry about it in terms of how it's affecting our estimates of large scale, um, of you know, large scale characteristics of the perturbations to, to zero for the stellar halo. But um, it's not gonna, it's not predicted, at least in this case, to overwhelm the signal from the LMC. So that's good. Um, so just to summarize what I just showed, the LMC induced dark matter wake affects the global kinematic properties of the Milky Way halo. Um, and we you know, showed that spherical harmonics might be a useful tool in characterizing these kinematic patterns and disentangling dis, uh, disequilibrium features on uh, large and small scales. Uh, we need to worry about debris from recent massive accretion, like the Sagittarius stream, when we're doing this kind of calculation. But, you know, our preliminary analysis show that the signal from Sagittarius, while it will contribute, should not overwhelm the signal due to the LMC-induced dark matter wake. But I can't go any further without mentioning that shortly after these papers came out, there were a few really exciting observational papers that came out. Uh, so first of all, this is a really exciting nature paper from Conroy, and you all were involved in this paper as well, uh, highlighting that it, they had found an overdensity trailing the LMC in its orbit, just as was predicted from Nico's simulation, as well as an overdensity opposite to the LMC, uh, which is extremely, extremely exciting. Uh, in addition to potentially detecting the wake in the density structure, there's also a paper uh, claiming the detection of the reflex motion due to the LMC's infall. And so this is a paper from Mike Peterson and Roy Penarubia, where um, this paper, this map is you know, showing the Milky Way with the LMC's orbit as the dashed line. And then they modeled the velocity field as having a velocity dipole. And the orientation of that dipole is indicated by the position of these of these contours. And so what they found is that the net motion of the outer halo with respect to the inner halo is pointing towards the LMC's past orbit, like where it used to be before it came around from pericenter. And this makes sense because this is where the LMC has spent most of its time during its interaction with the Milky Way as its infall, and then it comes around pericenter very quickly. So these are some really exciting findings, and we've made so much progress on understanding uh, how the LMC is affecting the density and velocity structure of the halo. But I also want to mention a note of caution, which is that we haven't yet reproduced these, um, these findings in cosmological simulations. We haven't yet found dark matter wakes in cosmological simulations. We're working on it. I'm not saying we will. We, I think we will. <laughs> but, um, but I wanted to emphasize the importance of validating these analysis methods in the context of a realistic setting where you have a realistic stellar halo that's made up of you know, primarily accreted dwarfs. So this is a project um, that's being led by Alex Riley, who was a grad student at Texas A&M and recently moved to Durham, where he, uh, and we're also doing this in collaboration with Nico and also Adrian Price Whelan at CCA, uh, where Alex is taking snapshots from the fire simulations where we have a host with an LMC analog and we can test, can we accurately recover the velocity dipole in a realistic halo that's made up of galactic substructure. And so this is a particular, particular analog that Alex has looked at 
And what he finds, so here's the position of his LMC analog on the sky as a function of time. And he can model the overall halo as a velocity dipole and compute its direction. And so this is like here, time zero is pericenter. So this is pericenter, this is after pericenter, this is before pericenter. When he computes the magnitude of this velocity dipole and its orientation, he finds, just like Mike Peterson found in his paper, that the orientation of that dipole is pointing towards where the massive satellite was as it was falling in, which is a really fun result. So Alex is finding, yes, you can accurately recover velocity dipoles in cosmological simulations, but galactic substructure is a problem. And so stay tuned for results from Alex. He's writing them up now. So excited to, to, show, to show more results from Alex. But I just think it's really important to, to test these, these observational procedures in a realistic setting, like a cosmological simulation, um, and to get at you know, what are the quantities that we really need to constrain observationally to fundamentally you know, the predictions. Uh, finally, I just want to mention that I think this is a great opportunity. The study, for in particular, characterizing the wake is a really exciting Rubin Roman synergy. Um, given that, you know, Rubin will get huge wide field proper motions, um, and Roman can be used to get very, you know, high, very precise uh, proper motions um, on smaller scales, that this is an ideal team for characterizing the tangential signatures, the signatures in the tangential velocity field for the LMC induced dark matter wake. Okay, so to summarize part one, LMC, more massive than we thought. Thanks, Christina, for, <laughs> for letting us know. Um, spherical harmonics may be a useful tool in characterizing the kinematic patterns induced by the wake. We need to worry about debris from massive accretion. I've already summarized this, so I'll just say we should, looking forward, we should really be testing these things in cosmological simulations um, in order to interpret you know, these observational results. And upcoming surveys are going to be really exciting for studying this, pro this problem further. Okay, part two. So I want to shift gears for the rest of my talk and focus on the dwarf galaxy progenitors of the Milky Way stellar halo. I told you how we can use halo stars as tracers in our own galaxy to study the underlying mass distribution, but now I want to talk about how we can use those stars to learn about the dwarf galaxies that they came from. So to motivate this, I want to start by showing you these two, sometimes I call them waterfall plots, sometimes I call them spider plots. Um, you can call them whatever inspires you. But here I'm showing you two plots that are showing the formation histories of two of the galaxies from the Latte Suite. So what do I mean by that? This plot is a 2D histogram of formation distance as a function of formation time for every star particle in this is the M12M simulation. This is the M12R simulation. And so just to orient you in this plane, these thick bands of stars that are forming, you can see that there's over density in this plane at low formation distance. These are stars that are forming in the disks of these galaxies. However, in contrast, these you know, streaks at larger distances, these are stars that are forming in dwarf galaxies that end up orbiting the host of the, the main host in the simulation, the Milky Way analog. Um, and then these streaks that are hitting, you know, the disk at late times. Uh, so yes, this is formation time. This is Big Bang. This is present day. Um, these I'm streaks, sorry, what, uh, yeah. you just confused. Which way is this going? Like the, the... Yeah, you're right. So, okay, Big Bang is Big here. Big Bang is there. I thought, oh, okay, I thought it was up there. So. Yes, no, I appreciate that it's confusing because I also have another time axis here. So I just made it extra confusing. <laughs> um, so yeah, Big Bang, Big Bang, Redshift Zero. This is stars forming very near or in the host, the main host. These are stars forming in other galaxies far away from the host. And these galaxies are ones that are falling into the host and building up the stellar halos of the, the host at Redshift Zero. So you can see here, you know, this is these are stars that are forming in a dwarf that then falls into the Milky Way. It does pericenter and then it completely stops forming stars. That's how we can read read this plot. Um, so in this M12R uh, galaxy here, 
So this is one of the galaxies that was picked in the hope that it would look something like the Milky Way LMC system at redshift zero, because you can see it's got these very thick bands here. So these are very massive satellites that are entering the halo at late times. Um, M12R has an assembly history that's dominated by these massive recent accretion events. These are where most of the stars in the halo are coming from, are these big systems that are arriving at late times. As opposed to M12M, where you can see, it might be kind of hard to see, but there's this like a bunch of activity early time. The disk sets up really early, and then there isn't a lot of massive accretion events until uh, we have you know more surviving dwarf galaxies, but not as many massive accretion events contributing to the halo. So how might we, you know, if we're observing these galaxies, how would we be able to tell that these galaxies have different assembly histories? And there are a lot of ways to tell, but the one I want to focus on today is in the chemical abundance ratio distribution. So what is that? <laughs> it's a mouthful. Um, but when I say chemical abundance ratio distribution, what I really mean is the distribution of stars in the plane of, for the purposes of this talk, magnesium on iron, versus iron on hydrogen. So this is the distribution of a stellar halo for M12M. And this is the distribution in the stellar halo in the chemical plane um, for M12R. And you can just see visually with your eyeballs that they're very, very different, right? And I can get into why they're different, but I wanna, I wanna sort of take a step back and talk about, talk about why this is a useful plane to look at at all. So why, why did I pick you know, magnesium on iron versus iron on hydrogen? And the answer has to do with the origin of solar system elements. So I have to show this incredible. I feel like everybody who talks about chemistry shows this, this graphic because it's so useful, where this is a created by Jennifer Johnson. And it tells you for every element in the universe, <laughs> um, what is its origin? What, what astrophysical process created this element? So if we focus on iron for a second, or sorry, magnesium first, <laughs> if we focus on magnesium, Magnesium is produced almost exclusively in type two supernovae and exploding massive stars. However, if we look at iron, iron is produced both in exploding massive stars and in type 1a supernova in uh, exploding white dwarfs. And so this is really useful because these two processes, type 1a supernovae and type two supernovae occur on different timescales. So as a result, because we have this chemical enrichment on different timescales, we can use the chemical abundance patterns of stars to tell time within a dwarf galaxy. So this is called the Tinsley-Wallerstein diagram, where here I have, you know, sometimes called alpha, I might say alpha instead of magnesium sometimes, uh, on the alphas, you know, all of the processes, all of the elements that are produced in uh, type twos typically. Um, it, alpha over iron on the y-axis and iron on H on the x-axis. Um, as stars are forming in a dwarf galaxy, they'll start here producing iron and alpha elements in relatively equal quantities until the type 1a supernovae turn on, which is on a longer time scale than the type 2 supernovae. Once the type 1a's turn on, what happens is you get this knee feature, and that's because the type 1a's are producing much more iron relative to the alpha elements that are produced primarily in type two. So once the type 1a's turn on, we start getting more iron enrichment relative to the alpha enrichment, and that causes this knee feature. And then this knee feature will occur at different um, iron abundances depending on how efficiently you're forming stars early on. So if you're forming a lot of stars really efficiently early on, you can get in a lot of type twos before your type one A's turn on. So you get a lot of enrichment just from type twos to get to a high metallicity before you turn over. Whereas in a low mass system, if you're forming stars kind of more lazily, you will only get in a few type twos before your type one A's turn on, and then you'll get the speed feature. So if we go back to looking at these maps in fire, these uh, chemical abundance distributions in fire, what we see in this map in M12M is that the density in this plane is at relatively high alpha, uh, relatively high magnesium, and relatively low metallicity, and around you know minus one, we have higher density in this plane right here compared to M12R, where M12R's distribution extends to higher metallicities 
and lower alpha abundances. And this is because M12M's halo is comprised of things that were mostly accreted pretty early. It is not comprised of these massive, um, these massive dwarfs that had very extended star formation histories that let the halo have this extended uh, metallicity distribution to high metallicity. Does that make sense? We're okay? Okay. So the goal of this project uh, was to say, okay, we can see with our eyeballs that if we have different abundance distributions. This is implying something about the relative assembly histories of these galaxies. How can we go from you know, looking at an abundance distribution and making quantitative inferences about the overall assembly history of the galaxy? So when I say quantitative inferences about the assembly history, I mean, can we constrain the mass spectrum of accreted dwarfs, which is what uh, dwarf galaxies of what masses contributed to the overall stellar halo um, and the mass accreted as a function of time. So that's what, that's what I mean when I mean quantitative inferences about the assembly history. So the, and so again, if I say CARD, that stands for chemical abundance ratio distribution, and that just means the density in this plane. Okay, so how can we use CARDs? Um, so the idea here is that what if we used empirical templates? So I apologize in advance that this is a bananas plot with a lot going on. So I'll walk you through it, don't worry. Um, this was an idea first proposed by Dwayne Lee, who was a graduate student uh, of Katherine Johnston's at Columbia, um, where the idea is that is asking the question, can we use an empirical template of a dwarf galaxy to describe the stellar halos of um, to, to describe the accreted stellar halos. So in this plot, what I'm showing you are templates for the abundance distributions of dwarf galaxies of different masses and quenching times. So if we zoom in, in this plot, as we're going down this grid, we're increasing in stellar mass. So this is a grid of dwarf galaxy abundance distributions where we're increasing on stellar mass on this axis. And then as we go from left to right, we are going to longer and longer uh, quenching time. So these are uh, over here, we have uh, dwarf galaxies that are quenching late in the simulation, so close to present day, whereas these are systems that are quenched very early. So if we zoom in, this is our template for a dwarf galaxy abundance distribution that is very low mass. You can see it has very low mean metallicity and it quenches very early. It quenches in the first two eight years of the simulation as opposed to a higher mass uh, galaxy that quenches, quenches very late in the simulation. So we can see this system has a very extended abundance distribution towards high metallicity and low and lower alpha. Okay, so the idea behind this technique is can we write down this abundance distribution as a linear combination of these empirical templates where in this context, the coefficient that goes with each template corresponds to the fraction of mass in the halo from a dwarf galaxy of a given stellar mass and quenching time. Um, yes. Absolutely. That, yeah. <laughs> okay. That's PCA right there. Exactly. Exactly. So, as I mentioned, this was first introduced by Dwayne Lee, but they did this in the Bullock and Johnston simulations first, where they didn't have self-consistent chemical enrichment. It was prescription. So it definitely worked in that context because the, the chemical properties were given from recipes um, where we wanted to test this in a hydrodynamical cosmological simulation with realistic chemical enrichment. Okay, and I have to acknowledge again, I mentioned NOND at the beginning of my talk. NOND is incredible. Uh, grad student of Robin Sanderson at uh, UPenn, and in order to create these templates uh, in the fire simulations, I relied heavily on Nan's expertise and his work of uh, from identifying the streams and their dwarf galaxy progenitors in fire. So if you want to play with streams in a cosmological simulation, his catalog is public. Go check it out. Go check out his paper. Um, yeah, it's fantastic. Okay, quick disclaimer before I go any further. These templates that I'm showing you are not safe for use on your observational data. <laughs> do not, do not let, uh, they're, yeah, don't play with them and observational data at the same time. So I'm showing you here uh, an example abundance distribution for a latte disrupted dwarf and then a similar uh, dwarf and stellar mass sculptor in the Milky Way. And you can see they look nothing alike. And we understand, we understand this pretty well. In general, you know, the dwarfs in fire are not 
are too metal poor relative to the observations. Um, so this is from Non's paper showing the observed dwarfs relative to the, the dwarfs in fire. This has been shown in a few fire papers. Uh, fire is not quite getting the metallicities right. Um, part of this we think has to do with the delay time distribution for type 2 supernovae. So check out paper from uh, Pratik Gandhi, who's an awesome grad student of Andrew Wetzel's for how this helps resolve this discrepancy. But I just want to mention that that's that's okay. It's okay that the templates aren't meant to be played with in or in um, with observational data because we wanted to test this in a realistic setting, not necessarily to show that if we can construct templates in fire, we can uh, recover assembly histories in fire. That's the question because that would then give us more confidence if we could construct templates observationally, we could recover. Uh, observational properties of accreted dwarfs. Okay, so we want to know, does this technique work in a cosmological simulation? And so what this means is that if you have the stellar mass and the time that a dwarf galaxy that contributed to the stellar halo took to form that stellar mass, can you predict its abundance distribution? That's kind of the hidden, hidden, um, hidden question in this in this project. So can you use empirical templates to predict abundance distributions for dwarf galaxies of different properties? And what are the limitations? So the answer is sometimes yes. Sometimes. <laughs> this is a success story. So this is my favorite success story. This is M12F, where we found that the linear combination of empirical templates constructed from present day dwarf galaxies did a very reasonable job of modeling the abundance distribution of the stellar halo. So this is the simulation, stellar halo abundance distribution. This is our model from our template set constructed from dwarf galaxies in the present day. And when we look at the residuals, we see they're very nice. They're not perfect, but they're very nice. And even better, we can accurately, relatively accurately recover the assembly history. So here I'm showing you the mass as a function of um, a mass fraction as a function of the dwarf galaxy accreted mass. So this is the mass spectrum of accreted dwarfs. And the true value are the gray squares. And the points are showing, you know, a few, we played with a few different types of template sets. But overall, you can see they all agree. I think with this one, it's to within 4% or something. Very, very good. So, and then we look, you know, for mass versus quenching time. So these are the residuals on the bottom panels. And this is, you know, the mass spectrum. And this is the mass um, accreted as a function of quenching time of when the, the dwarf galaxy stopped forming stars. So in M12F, things are looking really good. And it's not unique to M12F. Um, we find that we can accurately recover the mass spectrum of accreted dwarfs to within 10% for four out of the seven latte halos that we tested. Um, which is using our dwarf galaxy templates, which is very exciting and very encouraging. However, I know I have, I, I'm gonna wrap up, yep. Don't worry, I'm getting to the failures and then I'll wrap up. <laughs> <laughs> the failure modes, uh, it doesn't always, it doesn't always work. Uh, so this is an example of our failure case, M12C. M12C, we have the simulation card here. We have our model from our dwarf galaxy and we can see that the model is just not good at all. It just doesn't look anything like the, the templates. And so what's going on here, and you know, unsurprisingly, we have a very poor model, and um, it's not recovering the properties of the assembly history well at all. It's a disaster. It failed. Um, but what's really interesting about this case is that what's going on here, what's causing this high density peak, this is the feature that's not recovered, it's a high density peak. This is actually a pericentric passage induced starburst where the system has fallen in. As it reaches pericenter, it triggers a burst of star formation. And this feature is just not replicated in any of the dwarf galaxy templates because none of the dwarf galaxies have had a pericenter uh, induced star burst. So the other piece of good news is that we can tell that our assembly history parameters would not be inferred well because our model residuals were so high. So an indicator of success. Sorry, I know I'm rushing this. So please ask me more questions about this uh, if you want to chat later. But um, but in M12C, we had very high model residuals. We had a very poor fit to the data. And as a result, we also had very high residuals in our prediction of the assembly history properties. Um, in contrast, M12F, we had very low model residuals and we had very low residuals in our inferred properties of the assembly history. So this is good news. We can use the fit to the data in order to quantify if our technique is working. And, um, and uh, yeah, so that's great. 
So just to quickly summarize part two, we can use the chemical abundance distribution in the halo uh, in order to study um, the dwarf galaxy progenitors that contributed to the dark matter, uh, to the overall halo of the galaxy. And we played with modeling the chemical abundance distribution as a linear combination of templates. Um, and we found this technique had success in recovering the assembly histories, but with some failure modes. Um, but the good news is the failure modes were super interesting. They were signaling differences in our halo population relative to our dwarf galaxy population. And so that would be great to know too. Quickly, so many observations, such an exciting time to be working on chemistry in the halo. The future is bright. And I'll leave my conclusions up and take questions. <laughs> So I have two questions, one about part one and the other about part two. So for the part one, I'm wondering the Milky Way reflex motion due to the LMC. Have signatures of that been found in the cosmic microwave background? I have. That's a great question. I have no idea. Yeah, we, we can follow up on that. Folks are thinking about this. Um, I'm not sure we should talk about more about that one for sure. I think it's an interesting idea. Yeah, I know there's talk at least with like Chris Carr about looking in the gas. Yeah. But I don't know about CMB. That's very cool. Cool idea. And uh, my question about the part two is, so in your analysis of, of the chemical abundances, you are essentially assuming that the alpha enhancement is correlated with when was the dwarf galaxy accreted onto the main halo? Yes. Would bursty star formation histories play the role of a devil here in the sense that you can get alpha enhancement if the galaxy was accreted in recent times? I'm guessing you could also get alpha enhancement if the galaxy had a recent burst of star formation. Absolutely. So that's a great point. Um, so if I show you, I can show you. You just, you knew what I wanted to show on a backup slide, didn't you? Um, so what gives rise to these failure modes are, we thought these are like four of the more massive dwarfs that we used in our sample, or so these three are in the halo and this is a dwarf galaxy. You can just see they look really different and that's because they have these very different star formation histories. So the fact that it was not an open question, it was not a given that this would, it was definitely not a given that this would work. The fact that on average we did pretty well, I think was a surprise, frankly, because of these effects that you're talking about. Um, but yes, I think particularly at the massive end, it's a little bit harder to have a reliable empirical template because we do have these diversities in the star formation histories. So yeah, you're absolutely right about that. Yeah, it's definitely sensitive to that. So I wasn't joking about the PCA, but it depends yeah. on how you're doing it exactly. And, and the question, first of all, are you allowing for negative coefficients? So I would think if you allow for negative coefficients, that would actually solve your problem. So which problem? Well, so you have a set of templates, which you're trying to reproduce other templates. Mm -hmm. And that's your space. Mm -hmm. And PCA is a linear method. So that gives you the linear combination specified. Mm -hmm. But it's a mathematical trick. It's not a physical trick, mm. but it's dealing with the shapes and a negative shape. You know, you know, you may say, well, what does that mean in isolation? It's tricky. But on the other hand, say that little peak you had mm -hmm. that might, you know, have suppressed that. Yeah. Okay. By saying we need to act together to eliminate, you know, this particular you know, right. first or merging event mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so i i think this is very interesting um and i yeah. think it's if, if you think about it this way not you know for necessarily decomposing granularly but you know, each little thing means something mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but how to produce the whole thing and an overall history which is you are after that may actually be successful mm -hmm, mm -hmm. interesting that's a great point yeah it goes from you know you lose some of the interpretability by allowing for negative coefficients. Yeah, it, it's it's a tricky thing because yeah. people often get gummed up when they want to interpret, yeah. you know, what all the eigenvectors mean. You know, it's just a projection. But if you ask the questions a different way with that formalism, mm -hmm. it may actually give you something. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you. I'd love to thank our speaker again. <laughs> <laughs> Yay for me. Oh, sorry, Hayden, did you have, well, 
I didn't really, I didn't see. Well, you can ask your question, Hayden, but if folks- Yeah, if, it, if it's not too late. <laughs> go for it, but if folks usually, you should go ahead. Sorry about that. Fair enough. Um, hi, Emily. Thanks for such an awesome talk. Sorry, I couldn't make it in person. I'm, I'm just curious if uh, this card technique has been applied to any actual observational data yet. And if not, um, what steps are there to, to get it ready to be applied to the Milky Way? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks, Hayden. So uh, one thing that I think is particularly important is getting very deep and extended MDFs of local dwarf galaxies. So I think that is a priority, um, in particular, a few upcoming spectroscopic surveys is not only to get the metallicities of the interiors of dwarfs, but also their exteriors and the edges. So I think getting, you know, really strong empirical templates of dwarf galaxies is definitely high priority to getting this method, you know, functional on um, on observational data. Another thing we've thought about is maybe creating sort of a hybrid template set where we can have a few dwarf galaxies that are really well studied and then train the simulations to match their properties and let us sort of interpolate on that grid using a hybrid simulated um, simulated uh, observed template set because there's new functionality to tune that in fire that's being worked on, which is to tune the yields in post processing, which is pretty, pretty cool. Um, so I think those are some of the steps forward. And then you have to do the other things to do it properly observationally, like worry about completeness and worry about your sample and, and worry about, you know, what statements you can make given what you have access to, the volume you have access to. But, um, but yeah, so those are some of the things, some of the ways forward, I think, to getting there observationally. Gotcha. Thanks. This is really cool stuff. Thanks, Hayden. <laughs> Thanks again, Emily. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>